I want to thank Panasonic for sponsoring this video. So many people have asked to see my sewing space. Well, today's the day. And it sure isn't pretty. So I need to purge, plan, and reorganize, but not necessarily in that order. So stick with me and I'll show you how I do it. Hi, I'm Cameron Brown of Just Get It Done Quilts. I give you tips, tricks, and strategies to help you make the quilt that you want to make. And if you like what you see, please hit that subscribe button. I just want to give you some background on my space. We downsized to this condo four years ago. This was a dingy dark den that we painted and put a door on and installed a Murphy bed so it could be an occasional third bedroom. But ever since it's been a revolving doors of kids moving in and kids moving out. And just recently, my eldest son stayed here while he was undergoing chemotherapy. And each time I pack up my stuff and move everything into my bedroom. And then I bring it back in. And hopefully for a little longer this time. So I thought this would be a good time to start a series about organizing your sewing space. Now, as I look over on this side of the room, you can see there's a ton of mess here, but truly this is all secondary issues. This is fabric, this is UFO and other stuff. I haven't touched it in weeks, and it's not a problem if I leave it for a couple more weeks. Today we are dealing with the foundations of your sewing space getting our sewing machine, our cutting table, and our ironing board in the right place. And the first step in organizing your space is acceptance. You have what you have. I know it's hard, but stop comparing your space to fancy filming sets. Some quilters have sewing rooms, some have dining room tables, some have closets. Every space, no matter how big or how small, has advantages and disadvantages. So take a deep breath because you have what you need. No matter what size your space is, the foundation of any sewing space is the sewing triangle. Your sewing machine, your ironing board, and your cutting table. To avoid bottlenecks, they should be about three to four feet apart, but never more than 12. There's more to the triangle than three points. It's about how you're moving in between these points. We have other needs as quilters. We need to have power to run our machine. We need lighting to light up our space so we can see what we're doing. We need access to storage where we keep our fabric. We have accessibility issues and we might want to be alone or we might want to have company. These variables can be hard to understand in a drawing. You need to be in your space and use your space to understand all the different priorities and how you rank them because we all have different needs. And since you have different needs with every project, I recommend, if possible, any furniture you have, you put on either casters or put Teflon pads underneath. You might need to push everything to the walls so that you can use the middle floor space or move it away from the walls so that you have some design space or even move your items to a different room. The most critical part of choosing your sewing station is posture. So when you're sitting, you want to be able to sit directly square in front of your needle. You don't want to be like this. You don't want to be tilted like that. You want to be square in front. And the other thing is you want your feet flat on the ground. You want a 90 degree angle in your hips and you want a 90 degree angle in your elbows with your shoulders down. Now immediately you're going to say, Karen, your table is at the wrong height. And it is. This table setup was made for my old Bernina and this new one is too big for the opening. And I have two calls in to the manufacturer of this unit asking for help in a solution and they have not returned my call. And I think that's an engineer telling me that there's no solution. So I'm still working that through. My solution at the moment is to bring my chair higher. Now I have that right angle in my elbows, but now my hips are too high. So I put my presser foot on a yoga block. I have two yoga blocks down there that can bring my feet back up 
and I have that right angle power. You don't want a situation where you're tripping over your power cord as you're accessing your cutting board and your ironing board. So you want to make sure that you have good hookup in place. I have one down in this corner here and I've actually had to cut my drawer face so that I could still use the drawer. There's other considerations like where are you putting your coffee mug? I have access to a ledge here by a window. I've added an iPad stand because I'm very isolated in this space. So this allows me to attend Zoom meetings, uh, watch movies and listen to audiobooks. The other two main considerations are lighting and storage, but I'm gonna talk about those in another video. Your ironing table needs to be the height of your forearms about four inches. You'll also want access to some snips or scissors, water, and starch if you use it. And if you have a tailor's clapper or a sew stick or your limp brushes, they also need to be stored nearby. This is my DIY ironing table. Not only is it the perfect height for me, the racking underneath provides storage. You could easily find a size to fit in a closet to store when you're not using it. I'll put a link in the notes to a video I made showing you how to make it. And for months, the cord on my iron seems to be getting always in the way. I'm either tripping over it or it's dragging over my quilt tops. And I was remembering that I used a cordless iron at QuiltCon during one of their workshops. And I was just in the process of doing research online and asking other quilters about it when Panasonic called and asked me to take one for a test drive. So it arrived, I unpacked it. It came with an iron, a base, and a user manual. I did take a moment to read the user guide first, and I was surprised to find out that it wasn't a rechargeable iron, which means there's no long recharging times and no batteries to replace. And it was pretty well ready to go right out of the box, as long as you remembered to turn it on. I timed it. It took 60 seconds till I had good heat. I preferred to put it on for 50 more seconds to have super hot heat. And because the iron was cordless, it didn't matter whether it was on the left side or the right side of my ironing table. So not only was it cordless, the base had this retractable cord, so you only had to pull out what you needed and nothing extra was underfoot. No matter how nice it was without a cord, but I'm an ironing junkie. It needs to deliver the heat for it to work for me. And I was so pleased at how well this iron worked. I tried it out on small pieces. I tried it out on big pieces. I tried it out on yardage. I tried it out on quilt tops. I took it on the road with me and I did some freezer paper, paper piecing, and had no problem getting the heat I needed. I used it in some quilt sandwiches. I tried it with bonding powder and I tried it with fusible batting and it gave me all the heat I needed. And finally, I took one of my husband's work shirts for a test drive and these are crinkly. And I could not believe how good it could make a rough and tumble shirt look. So when you place it back in the base, it's re-energizing, not recharging. I've never had a situation while using it where I had to wait for it to heat up. Usually the time of moving my, my fabric around or flipping my quilt over was all the, the time it needed to re-energize. Here are a couple of other features that I didn't know I wanted, but now I have them, I'm not giving them up. It has two heads on it. That means you can grab it anyway, you can use it forwards, you can use it backwards. Also because it's cordless, I found I could use my non-dominant hand with it. It has a retractable cord. So it fits nice and neatly into the base when I need to move it from location to location. It has vertical steam. So if I want to steam my clothes in my closet, I don't have to worry about dragging that cord in there, finding power. I can just bring the head with me into my closet to steam my clothes and it has an auto shut off. Now I know lots of irons have auto shut offs, but not a lot of portable travel irons have auto shut offs. And I've been taking a couple of those for a test drive this year and found out I kind of need that feature. 
Now, you might be asking, is there anything I didn't like about the iron? Well, I have a love-hate relationship with the cover. This cover is great. It fits on nice and securely. Very quickly, you can take it and go. It's self-contained. Because you have the base, you don't have to wait for it to cool down. And the cord, as I said before, retracts really nice and easily. So you don't have to worry about anything dragging on the ground. It's all in one place. And then when I arrive someplace, again, I don't need to reset things up. It's on its base, it finds its location, and it's nice and simple. My problem is, is that this is another piece of stuff that you gotta worry about. I can't put it in my locker because when I'm moving around, I need it. So it's in my sewing area or when I'm traveling, it stays nearby and I have to find a place to keep it where it's not underfoot. But with all the other wonderful features of the iron and how useful it's become, I realize this is just something I can live with. My sewing table expands to a cutting table. Though this was designed that way, I'm sure there are several IKEA tables that you can hack to do something similar. Your cutting table doesn't necessarily need power, but it does need access to good lighting. You should be able to stand square in front of your cutting mat with your ruler and cutting lines perpendicular to you. Ideally, the height of your cutting table should be the height of your forearms less two to three inches. This allows you to push through the cutting motion without straining your shoulder or your wrist. So this table is actually too low. So it's not a problem for me if I'm just doing a couple of pieces and I practice good form, but if I'm cutting a lot, if I'm cutting all the pieces for a quilt, I am doing it on my kitchen counter. Next to your cutting board, you need easy access to your rotary cutters and your favorite rulers. And you produce a lot of scraps, so have a collection system nearby. Which leads into the last considerations you need to think about when designing your space, and that is there are many stages to making a quilt, and you may not do all of them in the same space. And so often that ends up to us having tools and fabric scattered all over the house. So make sure that your secondary locations have a station. For example, I do my English paper piecing and my binding in my living room. I have a little station here that has all the things I need and storage. Or design yourself a kit that you can easily pick up and move from place to place. Or simply having a checklist or a packing list. When I long arm my quilt, I do it at a totally different location. I have a checklist that I refer to so that I bring all the necessary items so when I get there, I don't need to have to borrow them or buy them. And of course, the checklist ensures that I bring everything home. And my last note here is that your needs and priorities change as your sewing improves and your lifestyle changes. So having flexible furniture and tools means they can grow with you. Still to come in this series, I need to purge, clean, reorganize, and of course deal with this mess over here. So stay tuned. For more details on the Panasonic cordless iron, I'll have links in the notes below. Last week on Karen's Quilt Circle, I had Irina of Sugary Do. If you haven't seen it yet, I will also leave a link in the notes below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts. And of course, my website at JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care and I'll see you next time.